And I am so grateful to God that I said no to temptation. You have to be in the Word of God, and you've got to keep a, a sensitive, clear conscience. And you cannot allow your mind to fantasize. You can't. You just cannot allow your mind to go places. And you have to deal radically with lust. Um, Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Something the Steve Lawson episode should teach us all is to watch what you say. When we think about what's happened with Steve Lawson and other pastors, really, truth be told, everyone, there's something that can be learned. As a matter of fact, there's something that should be learned, something that we should not forget. This is a story about sin, about his sin, about sin in particular, but also about your sin, about my sin. This is how sin works. You'll find people who tend to get the greatest ridicule for their sin. Those are the people who may have spoke harshly, uh, brazenly, almost arrogantly about sin or a particular sin, and then they themselves find themselves in sin. We see that with Steve Lawson. He has spoke harshly and critically about other folks, especially about sexual sin and about maintaining purity and things like that. And everything he said was correct. The problem is, though, he finds himself stuck in that. As a matter of fact, it's, it appears that while he was saying some of those things, he was also carrying on a relationship with some other woman. Now, don't know the details or the particulars of this relationship. It wasn't just communications, just talking, maybe meeting, holding hands. I don't know. Uh, some say that it was nothing, nothing physical. Some say it had to be. I have no idea. As a matter of fact, that's not really even the concern because the truth is that if you look at a woman or just you're thinking you lust in your mind, it's the same thing according to the Lord. Now, let's be clear. And this is where we kind of move away from Steve Lawson to us. How many of us have done the exact same thing? while at the same time railing against that particular sin. How many of us have talked about something and then did it? How many of us, as a matter of fact, have even talked about something because we're trying to convince ourselves not to engage in that? How many of us have talked down about something that we ourselves are struggling with? How many people are struggling with their sexuality but talk bad or talk down to those that are also struggling with? They also are fighting it themselves. How many people are having issues with anger, but are quick to also say that these things such as having wrath and anger, we should not have. So it's possible for a person to struggle with something as well as call it out at the same time. How do I know? Well, let's give you a perfect example from the Bible of someone who did just that, because it seems a bit hypocritical to talk about something when you yourself are struggling with it as well. But what about Peter? Peter was the first one to claim that he will never depart or leave the Lord. As a matter of fact, he even pointed to the other disciples and they might leave you, but I won't. However, he's the first one to have left him. So do we hold that over him? No. What I have learned in dealing with sin, my sin and others, and how we deal with a person who's caught in sin is you hit and then you hook, meaning you hit them. You let them know that what you did was wrong, despicable, ungodly, the whole nine yard. But if you're not willing to hug afterwards, then you are just as wicked, just as bad as that person and their sin. Why? Because you're an unloving, unforgiving person. You are um, high minded when it comes to them. However, wanting some compassion, some love when it comes to you. And that's how it is. It's just a normal thing. We tend to um, have excuses and rationales for our sin but not the other person. That person should know better. That person's evil and wicked. Well, no, let's just look at how sin works, whether it be Steve Lawson, whether it be Corey Minor, whether it be you, this is how sin works. We go to James and notice what he says. He says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. There's something that's happening in your mind that you're thinking of and you, you begin to entertain it. He says, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, 
it brings forth death. So how does this work? You think about something. Nah, no big deal. Let's say, for example, it's someone of the opposite sex and you look at this person. That's a nice looking person. And then the person says something, what have you, and you begin to entertain some thoughts. No big deal because I'm never going to act on this. Matter of fact, I've never done anything of the such. But you let that thought linger and it lingers and you begin to think about it and contemplate it and then wonder and then envision. And then after you envision it, it is in your heart and you're thinking about what would happen if I do that? I won't ever do but what would happen. I wouldn't mind doing it. And then you do it. And this is where we see the very first time that sin shows up uh, in the garden. It started off with a woman with a desire. The Bible says that the, the, the beast of the field, the serpent was more clever than any beast of the field. And he goes to the woman and he in, and he puts something in her mind. But did he put it in her mind? He says, did God say? Well, that's not really what God meant. But he didn't really put anything in her mind because the Bible says when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Well, desirable to who? Desirable to her. So these are things that were already in her mind. And it doesn't take much from the enemy or anyone or just yourself to kind of push yourself there, to kind of find yourself over. You just kind of stumbled there. You nibbled here. You nibbled there. A little nibble, a little nibble, a little nibble. Next thing you know, you are in some place far away from the shepherd. And next thing you know, you get yourself caught in sin. Now, the Bible is clear. We are to do what when it comes to any sort of sexual morality? We ought to flee. You cannot play with that. You cannot put yourself in a position where emotions, feelings, senses are heightened. No, I'm sorry. When the lights are low and the music is playing, uh, the curtains are drawn, it's too late. You're not going to resist. As a matter of fact, don't put yourself in the position. Don't even allow yourself to entertain the thought. Sometimes, unfortunately, that's difficult because what we see put before our eyes all sorts of sin. Might it be something sexual, something lustful, maybe something with money, maybe something with food or addiction. It could be a lot of different things that kind of feed into our natural pro proclivities. Listen, in case you didn't know, we have a propensity to sin. We enjoy it more than we enjoy air, more than we enjoy food. Our bodies love sin, what it does for us. Even knowing what the consequences can bring, we are still, in many cases, ready, willing, able to go in and take the chance and feel bad about it afterwards. You can be sorrowful after you commit a sin and find yourself in a place to where you don't know how you got there and too embarrassed, too afraid, too ashamed to even reach out for help or to let anyone know. Well, that's where we come in. The Bible is clear what we ought to do. The Bible says, brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual. Now that presupposes that you who happens to hear about this are spiritual. There are those that will find a brother in a sin and will instead of wanting to help him, want to hurt him even more. Instead of wanting to build him up and bring him back to restoration, they would want to bury him even more. Now again, you should have you have to be willing to hit the person who sinned. And what I mean by that is you have to be ready to call it out, to hold them accountable, and then should they hold themselves accountable, should they go ahead and show that they are repentant? And, and and amiable to the desire to change, well, then you hug them, meaning you bring them in, you embrace them and you work with them. If you have enough, if you have enough energy and vim and vigor, enough strength to condemn, but you don't have the same amount of strength to show compassion and to restore, well, then you're just as bad. So there's nothing wrong with calling them out and nothing wrong with condemning sin. Nothing wrong with that at all. But you have to be willing to turn around and then put your arm around the person. Now, I don't know what stage uh, Steve is in. He might be in, in, in this stage of being just shell-shocked, just having to deal with all of this. And maybe he's thinking in his mind, well, it wasn't that bad. I was just having conversation. I was this, I was that. But that's what we do. We make a lot of different uh, excuses for why we are in it, why we are doing it. As a matter of fact, you might be doing the exact same thing, why you do certain things. I'm a Christian, but I'm this, but the but shows up because you've got an excuse as to why you're doing it and why you haven't gotten out of it. Um, I do this, but God still loves me. God knows my heart. And so he might be going through that. He might be thinking it wasn't as bad. I mean, uh, people have done far worse. And guess what? People have done far worse. People have maybe exchanged some texts that weren't, I don't know how graphic or what was going on with his, I have no idea. 
And maybe there was nothing to it. Maybe there was nothing graphic about it all. Just having a relationship with someone who's not his wife, um, but knowing or thinking that if it got out, people are going to say something. And so I'll just keep it to myself. And but the way it looks and now and I won't even speak about the way the church actually handled it, because the way you put it out, it, it leads to more suspicion. That's not the point. The point is, though, people who are caught in a sin sometimes feel trapped. And what we do, sometimes we might make, make it difficult for them to get out of the trap. We might give them a reason to not want to share with someone because the very thing that they're afraid of happening to them, you're the one that's going to do it. They're afraid of being beat up and knocked down and kicked and spit on. And they're afraid to do that. And then when they let it out or they see how you're acting, well, then you are proving their point, which makes it hard for other people to want to let go of their sin. Could it, could you imagine if the Christian community understood and called out sin, but also loved the person to try to come out of that sin? It would make it so much easier, easier for other people, Christians and non-Christians alike, to want to come to believers to be reconciled. Remember, we have been given that same ministry as we were reconciled to Christ. He hit us, but then he hugged us. He loved us. We have also been given the same ministry of reconciliation to reconcile people back to him. And so he says that if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in, in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Remember, you have been or are or will be in a similar situation at some point in time, maybe not to the same degree, but you're going to be caught in something. You're going to do something. And maybe it won't be something that you hold on for a long time and it just goes a while and no one knows about it. Because remember, the longer the sin goes and the more no one knows about it, the bigger it becomes and the harder it is to let go, which tells us we ought to have someone in our lives that we can be accountable to. Someone that also is willing to speak to us bluntly, boldly, but also lovingly. And so that's how sin grows. That's how it is with us. And so we need to be careful. He should have been careful about how condemning he was and should have been more open and forthright about what he might be struggling with. Apparently no one was around and knew about this, but also we not, we might need to be careful about what we say, how harsh we condemn him. Because Paul says, you who um, tell others not to steal, do you steal? But don't think because you tell folks not to steal and you don't steal, but you lie but you cheat, but you do other things, that that absolves you. No, you are still being a hypocrite. And that's the one thing we don't want to be. We need to be honest with ourselves. I know how rotten we are. I know how rotten I am, how rotten. That's why it didn't shock me. It doesn't shock me when men do what men do, when women do what women do, when human beings do what fallen human beings do. Even though we've been redeemed, we still have access to those same feelings, those same thoughts. And so be careful about what you say about another person that's fallen if you're not willing to also be there to help him up. Maybe you, and I don't mean that you necessarily be there to help Steve Lawson up, you'll never meet him, but someone else who's just like that. Because I can promise you, the more that you stand up and say with a chest stuck out, um, your head up high, that you could never do those things, I can promise you sin is on its way. Take heed, if anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. Be careful what you say. Watch what you say, because for many of you, your own words will condemn you. So it's okay to call out sin. It's okay, especially to call out bad doctrine. It's, cold. it's okay to be strong and bold in that, but it's not okay to do so and not show any sort of love, willing to show any sort of love in return. Amen.